guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Rama Free, and today on the episode, we have Eric Cressy with us. Eric is the owner of Cressy Performance with locations up in Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, he has a master's degree from UConn, worked in their athletic department, and then went into business uh, for himself. And has done a fantastic job, mostly in a, in a niche of baseball, but he works with, a, with all, a variety of athletes. But uh, has done a tremendous amount of speaking, writing, producing uh, videos and um, products and things along those lines. And, and really has been kind of the go-to guy when it comes to uh, specifically pitchers, but you know, baseball players in general. And so today we talk a little bit about how he manages his uh, training programs for high school athletes versus college versus pro athletes. Uh, a little bit of why he chose to go into the sports performance uh, arena as, a, as opposed to staying in the college setting. I want to make sure that we recognize Play Sports Performance Flooring for the job they do and the, the support that they have for Iron Game Chalk Talk, Talk. They're our sole provider uh, for the show, keeps it free for you guys. And uh, like I said, they have, a, they have a fantastic product. Here's an example an install they just done recently uh, on their their Facebook page. If you haven't gone and liked that, make sure you do. But Hillcrest High School, I really, really like this look. Um, this is their uh, their stone edge look with a wooden insert for their platform. Um, and so I think that gray scale flooring with the wood insert is, is very, very nice. So uh, check them out on their Facebook page. If you're in the market for flooring, make sure you reach out to them at playusa.com. And uh, I know those guys will take care of you. All right, guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm Ron McKeefer. I'm with Eric Cressy. I'm very excited about talking with Eric. You know, I've followed Eric from afar for a long time and finally get a chance to, to talk to him one-on-one here. And um, as most of you know, the guy is, uh, is a genius when it comes to functional anatomy and, and upper extremity and, and uh, uh, just overall functional training and um so I'm excited what he's going to bring to the table today, and and uh, appreciate you being on the show, man. Well, thank you very much for having me. Good to be here, Eric. Talk talk a little bit about um, you know how you got into the business in the first place. You know what what was you know what prompted you to say you know what I want to go coach athletes. Yeah, I mean originally uh, when I first went off to grad school, uh, I was actually really up in the air on what I wanted to do in the field. Um, I, I actually, uh, for a long time, kind of contemplated being a strength and conditioning researcher. So I went to the University of Connecticut, and at the time, we were doing a lot of stuff with exercise endocrinology. Um, in fact, my grad assistantship was funded by the U.S. Army to look at potential countermeasures to prevent stress fractures and, and female basic training recruits. So it was about as far away from training baseball players as you could imagine. So I, you know, I got there. I met with my advisor on day one and you know they got me signed up for organic chemistry and um, man uh, you know all, all this stuff that I would have done and to go in line with uh, you know kind of that that strength conditioning research route um, and just right around that time was when I had one of my first articles published on T Nation um, I was 22 at the time and uh, one of the grad assistants at UConn was a guy named Rajesh Patel. Um, Rajesh, uh, you know, went on to Holy Cross, and now he's the head guy at Quinnipiac. And he had read it, um, had caught a little bit of my other stuff online, and just said, "Hey, you know, uh, that was good stuff. What do you think about coming in tomorrow morning and coaching a little bit with baseball?" And I was lifting in the varsity weight room with him, and I was like, "Hey, let's do it." And I, as I look back on it, it was kind of like the same test we might throw at an intern nowadays. Yeah. Hey, 5:30 a.m. lift tomorrow. Show up, and I know you're legit. Don't show up, and I know what you're really <laughs> about. So sure enough, I uh, I showed up, had a blast with it, um, really enjoyed it a lot, and uh, you know, kind of led to to doing some volunteer stuff at, at UConn. And Rajesh actually left at the end of that semester. He got a, a job offer elsewhere, so he finished his degree from afar. Um, but I was very fortunate that uh, the two other individuals who were there, Chris West in particular, Chris was the associate head of strength and conditioning, um, won a national championship with uh, with men's basketball team just recently, and also is a real pioneer in the in the soccer world. Chris really took me under his wing, and and also. Also, Tina Murray, who's gone on to, the, to Louisville now, um, gave me some of my first coaching opportunities. So it was really just getting my feet wet and realizing what it was I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, really at UConn, a lot more of the stuff I did was basketball and soccer. Um, and it just so happened, uh, you know, when kind of 
the time came to, to finish up at grad school, I had, I had done most of that stuff. Um, and a good job opportunity came up in the private sector, you know, and, and I hadn't really pursued the college thing heavily. And I knew I kind of liked the idea of maybe being a little bit more specialized in, in one sport and maybe being able to control my own destiny a little bit more. So I think that the private sector had maybe a little bit more appeal. Um, my, my dad ran his own business. I started out at business school, kind of having with some entrepreneurial thoughts. So it, it gave rise to that and I eventually wound up moving into Boston and really some of the first guys I started working with were baseball players. Um, I had four of them that first offseason I was here. Um, all four of them went Division One. Uh, one of them won State Player of the Year. They won a state championship, and my phone started ringing yeah, off the that hook. that helps, doesn't it? <laughs> and, and what kind of happened over the course of time, uh, you know, I took a particular interest in it. I was a tennis player growing up, um, had a lot of shoulder injuries myself, and kind of had to learn the functional anatomy, the structure, and all that. And a lot of the stuff you see in those tennis guys is very identical to, you know, what you get in the baseball world. So, when I had kind of that springboard to, to work off of and you know the know-how in the back of my brain, I just developed it and high school guys became college guys, college guys became pro guys, pro guys had teammates, uh, you know, they had agents, things like that and right. you know, we got a hundred pro baseball players moving to snowy Hudson, Massachusetts every winter to train so it's, it's kind of cool how it happens though. No doubt, no doubt. Well, you know, and that, that was one of my questions was getting into, you know, why you chose the private over yeah, uh, the, the collegiate or the professional. Obviously, you got you know a, a great name in the baseball world. What what were some of the differences when with training the professional athlete versus? Because I know your business, you you have uh, you know a, a spectrum. Yeah. What are some of the biggest differences between training the professional yeah. athlete and maybe even the collegiate athlete or general population? Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I, I'm very, very big on is, is relationship building, and I think we could certainly do that in the college sector. But I, I also know that we are always limited by by logistics. You know, NCAA regulations on how many hours you're allowed to spend with an athlete. Um, you are limited by. I mean, they still can't give athletes, you know, a a, a bar with more than thirty percent protein. Yep. Oh, things like that. You know, they're they're mocha flavored bars that have too much caffeine that guys can't use. That's right. Um, you know, it, that stuff to me was like, all right, we're dealing with maybe a little bit more of a bureaucracy um, at times. And don't get me wrong, that's that's true of professional sports as well. Um, I, I think that I like the idea of maybe having a little bit more wiggle room and, and having the time and opportunity to, to really get to know players uh, as, as friends, uh, first and foremost, and to, yeah. to train them as athletes thereafter. So, you know, you walk into our facility and you might have minor league baseball players that roll in at 1130, you know, between their you know foam rolling, their warm-ups. Their strength training, their throwing, their med ball, all that stuff, sprint work, whatever it may be. You know, they may train until two o'clock, and we have guys that legitimately will stay at the facility till seven o'clock at night when we close. And they'll play ping pong, they'll hang out in my business partner's office, they'll make stupid YouTube videos. Like they, they really kind of embrace it as a culture. And I know, you know, that that certainly can happen in locker room scenarios and in the NCA. And there, you know, there's certainly a lot of stuff that I think is appealing on that end. But for me, the private sector has been good for now. Um, you know, that's not to say there haven't been opportunities on, on other. Fronts. Um, whether it's going to pro sports or right. even looking at the college route, but um, you know the, the time and the offer hasn't necessarily been right. Uh, you know, and, and there are things that I do miss about it. I, I think there's something to be said about being intimately involved with the success of, of one particular team. I mean, you know, in the private sector, you're you're really dealing with individuals. Uh, you're not really working to help one team win. I mean, we have guys on in all 30 major league organizations, so it's it's hard to cheer for one team when you when you turn on MLB extra innings at night. But you know, it's right. there are perks and drawbacks. To any dynamic you go to, and, and I'd like the private sector. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, anytime you can get as, as you know, I think as strength coaches, we always want to get as close to a one-on-one setting as possible because then you, yeah. you have the your most impact on an athlete. Um, exactly. I know you do some group training as well, and and, and you probably lift a lot of those guys in, in, in groups. But talk a little bit about you know the, uh, a daily schedule when they walk yeah. into the facility. Are you know are they starting with some foam roll and some recovery yeah. or what's the, what's the process exactly so you know it, it's going to depend on what how the age of the kid is you know if it's a, if it's a 14 year old kid in his first year of training training mean, he's not going to be at the facility every day whereas yeah, let's talk college or pro or, yeah know. so our college and our pro guys tend to be there monday through saturday with sundays okay. off um as, as a general thumb a lot of our baseball guys at least in the off season uh will tend to have lower body days on monday and thursday uh more upper body oriented stuff on on tuesday and friday um sprint uh potentially some med ball stuff on wednesday saturday so um what we kind of get when we do that is we get those those three kind of 24 hour blocks of, of 
of more intensive stuff. So, you know, basically Monday you have a lot of aggressive lower body stuff. That Wednesday to Thursday bridge, you might sprint and then, you know, less than 12 hours later, do some heavier lower body lifting. And then Saturday, a little bit more sprint work. Um, I think where baseball players are different is, you know, there's there's not the same level of, you know, they're not bench pressing 350 pounds. Um, the upper extremity focus is, is substantially different. So it allows us to kind of plan our training accordingly. Um, you know, I think the other thing that you appreciate with our guys is just about everybody in the baseball world, unfortunately, has been has been you know distant run, distance run into the ground. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are, are heavily aerobically trained when they get here. And I know there's you know a lot of a lot of the stuff Joel James is putting out and some of the stuff Mike Roberts is talking about. There's there's definitely a need for uh, an aerobic foundation in order to optimize recovery and stuff. Uh, I guess I'm usually lucky in the context that most of those guys come in with that, and, and we actually have to detrain it a little bit to get where guys need to be. Um, yeah. So you know that's that's kind of a tip of the week. We're, we're probably different than most of the the group training one uh, facilities in the, in the industry. Um, we're probably run more like a, a college weight room in the private sector. Um, we individually assess everybody on our, our you know our roster here and, and basically make sure that the program is 100 percent catered to them. So you might walk in and see 25 athletes training with you know six or seven coaches, but at the same time you're going to see 25 clipboards with 25 individualized programs. So I think for the athlete it gives them a better experience. Um, they get the benefits of the group environment, the motivation, the, the feeling of competition with other athletes, but they also get the individualized program. And, and for our coaches, you know, they don't get board coaching the same thing all day. You know, right. they get to see a bunch of different athletes and that, that's actually really, really important probably in the baseball world more than uh, any other sport, I'd say, simply because there's such a wide range of, of levels of congenital laxity. So we have guys that walk in that are just like Gumby. They're loose as can be, super lax joints, and right. those guys are in part successful because of that laxity. Like if you go into a hockey weight room, you go into a football weight room, you just don't see that. Guys are usually you know strung tight as a drum and, and – right. You can get away with aggressively stretching them, whereas in the baseball world, if you take a shoulder that is hypermobile and you stretch, I mean, you could you could ruin a guy's career. Sure. So we, we try to individualize that as much as we possibly can. You know, with with seeing a wide range of guys, I mean, you said you got guys on every on every roster. Hmm. You also see a variety of programs. You know, yeah. um, some good and some bad. I'm I'm, I'm yeah. assuming. You know. Yeah. What are what are some things? What are some commonalities with uh, that are positive? You know, what are some things that you that every guy's walking in with that's great that we're you know that the the team strength and conditioning approach is doing very well? And what are some things that are, are that are lacking maybe? Yeah, I, I, I think um, you know on, on the whole, baseball is starting, uh, and I'll speak more to trends that I'm seeing. They're starting to embrace some of the the reductions in distance running during the season. Yep. There are organizations that are going to maybe, maybe just interval stuff, maybe pure sprint work. So that's getting a, a little bit better. I think on the whole, you're seeing everybody foam rolling guys. Um, you know, I'd like to see more organizations, you know, embracing the idea of, of training minor league athletic trainers to to do more manual therapy for guys. For a long time, it's been the mindset, hey, I you know, I make eight thousand dollars a year. Why should I be doing grass and on fifteen different guys a day or something like that? So I think that part is a little bit frustrating um, at, at times, and that you know maybe some of that minor league staff isn't compensated the way they need to really do their job at the the level that they're capable. So you know that part's tough, but on, on the whole, you see more dynamic flexibility, a lot less static stretching. Um, I, I think we see more and more guys getting in the mindset of managing guys who are who are loose or jointed without aggressive stretching. Um, you know, so that's certainly a good trend. And, and guys are still getting you know into the gym in season. They're appreciating the importance. And you have organizations that literally just have guys in the in the weight room once a week. You have other ones that are much more progressive and, and push it a little bit more. So it, it's a really uh, individual thing, organization to organization, in terms of how much priority they focus on it. Right. But do you think uh, what's, what's, you're starting to see more forward-thinking stuff going on in Major League Baseball? Like you saw a couple years ago, the Mariners they you know they brought in Marcus Elliott as a consultant to try to shuffle things up, um, and you know the Red Sox got Mike Boyle, and just recently the, the Blue Jays hired Jamie Evans as a consultant who's a big weighted ball guy. And you know if you would, if you had thrown the context of, of weighted balls out 15 years ago, people would have run the other way. Right. And, and, you know, it's, I think it's good that we're starting to see a shift in the, in the paradigm to appreciate, you know, that it's, it's, it's about development. Um, the other thing I love about Major League Baseball, um, if you go and you lift, look at the list of the, you know, the top 15 or 20 guys in terms of salaries per year, uh, really you can make the argument that only one or two of those guys have actually lived up to their contract. 
Um, you look at Justin Verlander, you look at Mike Miguel Cabrera. So the Tigers are doing something right. right. But if you go along the list, you, obviously you look at the A-Rods, you look at, you know, even Jeter, who was a great player while he was, you know, healthy, he's missing almost a full year because of an ankle injury. So these huge contracts are not paying off. And Major League Baseball have this big tendency to just throw money at free agencies. And, and you know, what do we know about the, the fitness industry that I would assume would carry over to the baseball world is it's always the pendulum going too far in one direction. So what do we see at this end? You know, take guys who are at their peak, pay them a bunch of money. I mean, let's be honest, Albert Pujols is not going to look great in his early 40s. I mean, they're talking about a plantar fascia surgery already. Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum. What's the opposite dynamic? Hey, it's, it's, it's draft well and develop talent from within. Right. So I, I think that bullet's great for people who want to get into the strength and conditioning field and, uh, you know, and, and want to learn what long-term development of athletes is really about. And, and right. I think the opportunities are, are endless in baseball, not just because I think it's an underserved population, but also because of the dynamics that you're seeing in terms of the ethnic backgrounds of players. Right. Obviously, American players are getting more exposed to strength and conditioning. You know, there are there are a lot of players coming from the Far East who have very little strength training experience. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of strength training going on in in the Dominican or Venezuela or Panama. So, I think that's why those players are starting to thrive more and more relative to American players. So, there that's a trend I really like about baseball. Yeah, I think the stuff I, I, I don't like is um, the lack of continuity in, in organizations. Um, you'll see your major league baseball organizations where their entire minor league staff will turn over in a matter of a year, and you just can't get consistent care, consistent treatment, and a consistent message to impressionable young athletes. And that's happening. So I think that part is frustrating. Right. Um, you know, I, I think there are other dynamics. You know, in context of the medical model, things along those lines that that make things tough. Uh, you know, I have, I have pretty pretty individual views on you know what what constitute a guy who could be very good long term. I think a lot of a lot of players and teams are. Uh, or I, I should say scouts and teams maybe look at the draft process a little bit funky and you know they'll go after kids who have thrown 150 innings a year right. since they were 12 years old. So it's just a matter of time until those guys break down. But um, you know, I, I, I guess we just try to be a little bit more progressive relative to what we see. And don't get me wrong, there's some, I mean, there's some great people out there doing awesome stuff. I mean, the Arizona Diamondbacks, I think, are one of the best organizations in terms of a medical model. Um, guys like you know Neil Rampy and Ken Crenshaw and um, you know Nate Shaw doing an awesome job out there. So, you know, I think there are certainly examples of people who, who, are, who are doing things the right way. I think it's just frustrating in part because of the lack of continuity where, you know, we see $100 million worth of arms every offseason and our opinion sometimes gets thrown out the window to, you know, a 22-year-old low-A strength coach who's right. never worked in baseball before who just got a job. So, you know, we kind of make it a point to talk with our athletes and say, hey, listen, you're your own best advocate. We're going to educate you. We're going to teach you what's unique about your arm and your body. And we're going to try to put you in a position to succeed. And, and more importantly, to understand how to manage yourself and, and how to speak up for yourself and understand what's right and what isn't. But, you know, with all that said, number one goal for us is, is to work with the teams, sure. um, to, to create relationships, to develop continuity when players go back or when they come to us, you know, after a season on a rehab stint or even when they're just healthy. So, um, you know, we really just try to manage guys on an individual basis and, you know, uh, fortunately, we've been able to get in a position where the relationships with with a lot of teams are very, very good, and it makes our life a lot easier. Oh, no, you know, I, 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 we were talking off camera that you mm -hmm. know I started in baseball, and and mm -hmm. it's come a long way for sure. Yeah. My uh, quick story, and you know, I don't want to bore you with it, but Not we, um, you know, I, I showed up to a, 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 a you know a run. This is maybe second day on the job, you know, I'm, I'm by myself, and. Uh, you know, for the run that day, you know, we were we were warming up by throwing the dang baseball. You know, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But you know, mm -hmm. so long story short, Jeff Montgomery doesn't have a partner coming off an all star all star year. I played football. I didn't I didn't play baseball. You know, so we're in an indoor soccer arena, and we're ten yards apart. And I'm really concentrating, man. I'm I'm concentrating <laughs> throwing that ball right. I don't want to get made fun of my second day on the job. We, we keep backing up 10, 20, 30. All of a sudden, we're at goal to goal, right? I throw the ball, and it dribbles, you know, bounces two or three times to get to them. They start ragging me. And he's like, oh, you can you can just roll it. I'm like, all right. You know, so I, I root back, and I throw that thing up through the rafters, over into the batting cages, and it bounces and hits George Brett. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes storming around, figuring out, you know, trying to figure out who threw the dang baseball. So, I, you know. It's come a long way 
from warming up throwing a baseball to where it is now. But it's I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think you know just for our profession in general, um, mm-hmm. you know the value that you mentioned in um, putting more than just an intern or a seasonal guy in those those minor league positions. I I think you're right. There could be an investment made by organizations to to get that right, and mm-hmm. and probably not for you know, a tremendous amount of money, but as long as they kept Absolutely. it consistent, you know, and they had a good, uh, you know, a good somebody monitoring that or, or coordinating that. And, and, and I know a lot of those guys and a lot of those guys have worked for me, you know, uh, uh, Dana Cavalier with the Yankees, a former yeah. intern, you know, Jake Biting, former intern, you know, they, these guys are, are top notch guys that are, that, that care, that want, to, you know, that are going to do a good job and, and are doing yeah, a good job. And great teachers too, who can, who can mentor those guys. If, you know, if the financial wherewithal is there to keep them, you know, in a, in a place where they can financially make, get by. No you know? doubt. No doubt. I agree with you a hundred percent. You know, um, what turn you know one of the things I wanted to talk to you about you just came out with a, a product called functional stability for uh, the lower, uh, functional stability training for the lower body uh, you got functional stability training for core upper body's coming right um, you know what what is functional stability training how do you define that how do you, you know, why why is it important you know, I think it was a, it was initially kind of a paradigm that that Mike Reinald, who I collaborate on the product with, and you know, Mike was uh, worked with Dr. Andrews for a long time, was with the Red Sox for for seven years, and he's kind of kind of a free agent and being a dad right now. So, sure. you know, I think he came up with the concept more than anything, and, and really what it was, it was a almost an umbrella theme to look at. Hey, how do we how do we kind of unify the world of rehabilitation and and you know more high performance training? Because I think we're realizing nowadays that the line is getting very blurry. Sure. Um, you know, if you if you look at every Major League Baseball MRI, somebody's got something wrong on everything. No so you can always do an MRI, an X-ray, a CT scan, whatever it is, and find some stuff wrong on just about everybody. But that doesn't mean they're symptomatic. So, you know, you know, as strength coaches, we need to borrow from the PT world. And then, you know, on, on their end, uh, you know, they need to know how to progress guys back from injury and maybe borrow a little bit from the strength and conditioning world on how do we regress people, how do we progress people, right. um, depending on what we see on day one, whether they're symptomatic or not. So, um, you know, it started out as kind of a collaborative that we did a couple years ago and we decided hey let's let's build on this and, and the core did very well uh, so much so that people were kind of emailing and, and asking us at seminars all the time hey, hey when's, when's the next installment coming out what's sure. the plan so it was kind of like all right we need to make this into a series um, <laughs> so it's, it's gone well and you know really I think with a with a, a product like this it, it's cool because we can go in a lot of different directions um, it's kind of like all right what do you want to talk about what do you want to talk about all right let, and then we kind of just play off each other right um, especially with the lab stuff where you know one guy goes right for the other and you kind of tie it in and speak to, hey, this is what Mike spoke of, and, and here's how it relates to what I have going on. So um, we both did, uh, you know, actually he did like kind of four and, four and a quarter presentations. I did four. Um, so, you know, on top of the introduction and everything. But um, it was basically 50% practical and then 50% webinar. Right. I think, um, you know, this was a great, it's a great product. I'm halfway through it right now. And, and like you said, it, what's great about it is it's, it's a lecture, it's a webinar. Yeah. PowerPoint um, presentation, but then you it's turned around and followed up by a lab lecture, hands on. Yeah. Um, so you're able to see both, and I think it's a, a, a great product because I mean we get so caught up a lot of times as strength coaches, um, especially in, in in the college and pro setting, where you know athletic training is and sports meds over here, mm-hmm. strength issues over here. You know, don't come talk to me unless you know we got a problem type deal, yeah. and, and and it's a battle, and I, and I think. Yeah. You know, I think the great strength coaches, the good strength coaches, are the ones that can that that one recognize they know what they know and they don't know what they don't know, mm-hmm. um, and they're willing to uh, collaborate and, and have uh, a, a team environment. You know, yeah. and, and getting those players back. I mean, you know, I, I was talking to Joe uh, Ken yesterday, and the one of the biggest things with the NFL versus the college for me is, you know, you go from being evaluated off of numbers, you know, bench, squat, clean, whatever, to at the pro level, it's games lost. I mean, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really matter what any, you know, what, the performance part of it, and it does, but not, not to the same extent as, you know, we got to keep the talent on the field. If we don't have the talent on the field, it doesn't matter, you know. And, it wouldn't be there if they didn't have the numbers. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and you know as well as I do that that's not always the case either. I mean, a lot of times the guys are just yeah. so gifted – Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, they're not the strongest or they're not the fastest sometimes, but they're, they're just able to use what they have. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, 
but keeping them on the field is, is you know, that's uh, our job. And, and a lot of times uh, from a, a way to motivate those athletes, you know, I remember working for the Bucks and having Warren Sapp, you know, Warren Sapp was a, you know, the guy was unbelievable, you know, um, you know, he's playing in the Pro Bowl every year. He's, he's a stud. But, you know, the guy didn't do a whole lot from a training standpoint to get there. You know, he's all state without doing anything. He's all American at college without really doing anything. Gets to the NFL. Well, why should I be doing this? I'm, I'm all, you know, I'm in the Pro Bowl without it. Mm-hmm. And the argument and the motivation is, okay, you like making that two, $3 million a year, you know, don't you? I, you know, let's, let's add on to that on the back end, you know. And um, I think what's great about this product and, and, and you know, uh, the message that you and Mike are, are putting out there is, is that these things are easily integratable into your, your, your current, the meat and potatoes of a workout, you know, and, and, uh, you know, with that being said, where, where do you see, uh, a lot of these recovery strategies, a lot of these corrective exercise uh, strategies, where do you see them fitting in yeah. to that, those performance variables that you're having yeah. to train for? Yeah. And I, and I think when you use the term fitting in, you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, and, and obviously it's going to depend on the experience level of the coach watching this or, or, you know, the individual athlete, whatever it is. But, you know, for, for guys like us, we're not going to go to a seminar and overhaul our philosophy. It's right. not going to dramatically change everything we've done for, for decades. Um, instead, what it's going to be, it's going to be tinkering. And maybe it, maybe it affects one or 2%. And, and that one or 2% at the highest level could be a complete game changer for an athlete. That's so, right. you know, I, I view it a lot as it may change the way that you coach certain exercises exercises. Um, it may change the way that you assess an athlete in a general sense. Maybe you look for something slightly different or you work to address something with a different patterning. Um, you know, So Mike speaks a lot with respect to alignment. We've given all this focus to mobility and stability. Nobody speaks to an underlying alignment where we start off from and how that impacts what muscle length may be or what protective tension may be um, in place in certain places. So um, you know, one of the examples, I talk a lot about hip and turn rotation deficits in, in athletes. And you know, we speak in the context of you may assess them in a, in a, in a you know, general evaluation and find there's a limitation and then, hey, in the past, maybe we just go and we, we crank, we do some knee-to-knee stretches, um, you know, something like that. Well, we also know that we can create more valgus stress the knee when we do that. So we need to appreciate, hey, first off, is this truly a muscular issue? Is it, right. is it stiffness of those hip external rotators or is it a lack of core stability that's creating a certain level of protective tension? Um, is it retroverted hips where there's a bony adaptation where those guys are never going to get hip internal rotation no matter how much they stretch? Um, maybe it's a capsular issue where it might be as simple as just referring out to a good manual therapist. They get one treatment they feel like a million bucks. Sure. So you, know, you have this same general assessment potentially that, that may lead you down a number of different paths. So I think it's important for us to know you know, not just what it looks like, but but how to fix it if, if it can be fixed. So, um, you know, on that front, it's, it's all about just tinkering. And, and some of it may be as simple as, you know, adding an extra exercise to the warm up. It may be as simple as saying, hey, this is a predictable soft tissue restriction pattern. Right. You know, every one of our right-handed pitchers has a has a right subclavius trigger point that feels like a million bucks when it gets released. Yeah. So, you know, there are certain positions we'll put guys in during their massage. Um, you know, stuff along those lines, it, it may seem trivial, but you know, they always say, you know, um, you know, small hinges swing big doors. Right. So start with it, start with a little stuff and build on top of it over the course of time. So um, I, I think that's what we're trying to do. Give them some filler stuff. Where, and, and like I said, maybe coach things a little bit differently. Maybe help people to, to program certain exercises differently than others. Like that's that's some of the stuff I talk about with like my deadlift, um, you know, webinar. Where it's just like, hey, not everybody is is built to, you know, conventional deadlift. Yeah, you know, there's right. some people that have long femurs where it's not going to be a good fit. Um, you know, some people with retroverted hips, it may just feel awkward, whereas you put them in a sumo stance and they feel awesome. It's just, it, it sits right with their hip structure and you can make it work. So, um, like I said, it's, it's tinkering. It's not overhauling. No doubt. No doubt. You know, uh, there's there's probably not an article that I've read of yours that I haven't had to reread a couple of <laughs> times. You know, you're, you're obviously a smart guy. Uh, I think you have such a great grasp of functional anatomy and, and bio, you know, biomechanics. Talk a little bit about you know running a business, yeah. being a strength coach, and, and and being a lifelong learner. You know how's that you know how's that all fit together? How are you able to do that? Stay on top of your game because it's more than you know. I, I, you know one of the things and just kind of get off on a on a tangent here real quick Sorry. is you know a lot of young strength coaches are coming out and they're and they're very well educated they're they're you know they've they've gone through and and our exercise science programs and our understanding of of strength and conditioning principles and uh, and physiology has gotten a lot better and yeah. uh, you know at the university level uh, still got room for improvement no doubt mm-hmm. but 
but they're coming out and, and then it, it's almost like, that's it. I, I know what I know and I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. going, you know, and, and anybody that's ever been successful in this field has, has, has been a lifelong learner. Yeah. Um, and it's more than just what you learned when you were chasing girls and, and drinking beer and going <laughs> to class, you know, whatever yeah. it was, you know. So talk a little bit about your learning, you know, your learning process. Yeah. And then how you're able to fit that all together as a, as a, as a business owner. You know, and I think it's something that's changed over the course of time. Um, I mean, in the context of, of being a business owner, I think the first thing that was a, a, I, had a, I have a very patient wife who puts up with me doing way too much stuff. And I don't have kids. We have a, we have a dog, so we're kind of testing the waters with that. We'll see how I do that. Um, I also bought a house, a 90-second walk across the street from the facility. That helps. So basically, I got rid of my hour and 40 minutes of commuting every day, and that became instant productivity, and that's where the patient wife comes in. Because of that, she winds up doing a little bit more of a commute, so it's a it's an agreement we have, but she comes in and trains at the gym, so it's kind of a, a good deal, I guess. Yeah, right. Anyway, but um, you know, I think in the context of, of, of business development, the thing that made the biggest difference for me in order to be able to get everything done was was finding people that I trusted who I could delegate to. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started out, I was the guy that was doing the billing, doing the scheduling, you know, swiping the credit cards on top of you know giving people the the sales pitch when needed and giving right. the tours and all that and. You can do that when you're one man show and it's not very busy. When it gets to the point where you're doing 13 hour days, seven days a week, you, it, you hit like a critical threshold. Sure. Uh, you gotta you gotta step aside. And and where I was lucky was um, my business partner was actually my roommate my freshman year of college. Um, we both went to school thinking we were going into business. Uh, I was dead set ready to be an accountant, and I realized that that sophomore year I didn't want to go that route. And I transferred. Right. He stuck it out and then and then stuck around for, for an MBA. So <laughs> I have a guy that can handle you know the phone calls, the sales pitch, and he's been there since day one when we founded the business. So beyond just the know-how of what to do, he also has that emotional capital in the, in the business, knowing, sure. hey, this is something I'm excited about. I want to see successful long-term. I mean, like Tim Collins is, is one of our, our guys, actually his jersey in the background. Tim's in the biggest of the Royals. My business partner, Pete's a uh, groomsman in his wedding this fall, you know, just because they hang out so much in the off season. So, you know, for me, it's been a, it's been a great fit. And, and now we have a, a, another business partner, Tony Janicor, who's kind of more of the technician in the, in the trenches. He's more of an extension with me. So, you know, I always talk to guys who are looking to get in this industry about like, uh, you probably read Michael Gerber's book, the myth where he talks about there's the technician the entrepreneur and the manager That's great. Um, you know in our, in our business Pete kind of handles the entrepreneur and the managerial stuff yep. Tony's a pure technician and I kind of have to ride three horses with one saddle so I need to make sure that we you know everybody's crossing all their T's and dotting all their I's with respect to each one of those entities so um, it works but delegation made it possible for me to leverage my strengths more effectively yeah. and, and obviously there I mean there are phone calls that Pete can't take you know I, I tend to interact a lot more with the agents um, you know when we have guys who are on rehabilitation referrals you know and, and things like that then you know those are scenarios where I need to kind of get the, the nitty gritty of it but um, for all intents and purposes the more that we've been able to kind of subdivide those responsibilities so that everyone knows exactly what they're responsible for while still having a good communication environment. That, that goes a long way. Uh, I think professional development is actually uh, interesting because, uh, you know, I, I graduated from, from undergrad in 2003, Matt got my master's, finished up in 2005, and just watching what's happened over the course of time, like, I mean, the internet basically came around, so I got to college my first day in 1999, and met with my professor, and she's like, I need everybody to send me an email and set up a meeting, and I, no joke, I went back and I turned my around, how do I send an email? That's I didn't right. know I I was oblivious. He taught me how to use Instant Messenger. I basically had to learn how to like, type as fast as I could. And like the world has changed incredibly just in that time. Badass. You know, I, I never would have expected that we'd have as many continuing education opportunities in terms of, you know, continuity sites with memberships. You know, Reynolds has got rehabwebinars.com where you can go and you can learn directly from James Andrews. Right. Whereas in the past, you had to hop on a flight, go to Birmingham and beg your way in. That's right. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a different dynamic. We always had seminars, but the, the access to those seminars was never so good. Being aware of, of stuff in your hometown, you could miss it. Um, if it wasn't for the in, uh, internet. So right. I think that's changed uh, in the context of I probably read fewer books and do more reading online and watching more webinars, um, listening to podcasts like thing where, I mean, you can, you can listen to this thing right now while you're, while you're cooking dinner or doing whatever it is. So, you know, I was writing some emails this morning and listening to Brett Contreras and, and Jonathan Fast talk about Mark Ripito's article from yesterday. Like, yep. It's uh, it's a way to, to pack more continuing education into the day. So 
I think it comes down to just finding ways to be more efficient and, and prioritize. Um, I really don't watch TV. I mean, I have the MLB Extra Innings package, and if I'm watching TV, it's because I know one of our, our, our big league guys has a start. Um, right. So I, I'll turn around in the background while I'm doing my stuff. And, you know, so I, I think it has a lot to do with priorities. Um, you know, I, I didn't spend a penny on alcohol during my undergrad career. Right. Uh, and it put me in a good position to, to work on weekends, to work during the week, to, to get those hours early on. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that's the right way for everybody. I, in hindsight, I probably should have let loose and, you know, maybe had a little bit more fun back in the day. But, you know, I, I had a pretty clear vision of kind of where I wanted to go in a general sense. So for me, there, was, there wasn't really anything that was going to deter me from that. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's hard because, uh, and, and you may see this as well just from your college experience, What's the difference between the college kids that you saw in the last three to four years versus the college kids you saw in the early to mid '90s? A dramatic difference in what they are. No and doubt, no doubt. Well, yeah, like we talked earlier, I think I think they're more informed, you know, because they got access to all those same um, things that we do. They got access to the internet and things, you know, and and and, and coaches and and more, you know, uh, yeah. better training and 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 performance coaches and all those types of things. Yeah. It kind of goes into my, you know, in my next question with, you know, with so much information, how are you able to sift through it, and and you know, and then maybe you know, uh, lead into another question. What what are some sites or some places that you recommend coaches check yeah. out? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the first thing that I talk a lot to uh, with our interns each semester is I say, listen. Um, you know, the, the generalists eat last. There's a, there's a saying about that. And, and don't get me wrong, you need to be a generalist in many cases. But I mean, right. think about it right now, you're a specialist. Right. You're in football. You've been a specialist for, for years now. Right. And, and that's what's in part allowed you to get, you know, you've been able to send the ranks in the industry. Um, for me, uh, getting into a specialist, uh, specialist uh, or a specialty, I should say, was actually really beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't plan it. It kind of happened by accident. But as I look back on what we did, we were doing a lot of things right by accident. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, you can't tell a 22-year-old kid, you need to pick a specialty right now. They need to go out. They need to do internships in different capacities. I mean, I did an internship in cardiac and pulmonary rehab. I needed to do that four or five months. Um, to realize that it wasn't a good fit for me, even though it was a beneficial experience. So um, I, I do encourage kids to try to find that avenue because you can't be everything to everybody. It's right. a, I'm not a great foot and ankle guy, but you give me a post-op Tommy John guy or a labor repair or something like that, I, I have a very good feel for what to do with the upper extremity stuff. So um, it's because I, I see that you know all the time, every single day, and, and I've had a good sample size. But you know I'm not going to get that same level of, of kind of involvement on someone who you know fouls a ball off his foot and has three fractures there. I'm going to have to refer out and, and inquire a lot more of people who who specialize in that. And you know if you look at doctors, um, you know who's going to make more the guy who's the the specialty surgeon or the general practitioner? It's right. it's, it's it's pretty predictable thing. So I, I think that's the direction the industry is going. Athletes yeah. are getting more specialized than ever before, which isn't really a good thing, I know. Um, but I, I do think that the industry has to keep up with it. And, and one of the things that I think is really interesting, and you can probably speak to this even better than I, um, I know there's been a lot of reorganizations in the, in the structure of, of NCAA coaching staffs where in the past they've had you know uh, football coaches who were kind of uh, doing position-specific stuff with guys and they were, they were sliding them in under the strength conditioning heading. Right. Uh, so I know a lot of reorganizations or universities have reorganized to football and then Olympic sports to make sure that they didn't take advantage of that in the process I get probably six or seven calls every spring for people looking for baseball only strength coaches yeah um, I mean these are these are well-paying positions 401k full benefits yep. you know where you just have to work with one team and get really good at one thing and create a relationship with athletes you're gonna have for four years I mean that that to me sounds exciting I mean that's a that's a cool opportunity no doubt and it's it's definitely I, I agree with you I think that's where the, the the field's headed where it's it's special in a sport and I think it's great for our profession because you know yeah. the the value a strength coach brings to a, a team mm -hmm. um, there's no reason why sports outside of football and basketball and maybe not baseball shouldn't be pushing for a strength coach on their stat you know their staff as opposed yeah. to somebody that's having to do seven or eight different sports and I think I think another thing that's happening right now is is you're seeing uh you know the introduction of a, like a high performance manager somebody that can coordinate strength and conditioning sports medicine yeah. you know that that has practical experience instead of just being a former coach that's kind of inherited those you know that position that that's assistant good. ad or associate ad position so i i it's, it's definitely going in the right direction i think you're right i mean i think in my hiring processes i've always looked for somebody that's going to bring something to the table 
in terms of a specialized skill. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's some MMA or, or, or maybe it's, it's some catapult technology, you know, that they're, they're a technician, you know, when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, but you're right, getting, as a young coach, getting something where they're saying, I'm an expert in this area and I'm a generalist maybe in the other areas, I think is going to benefit them. Uh, yeah, I always talk to our, our applicants and, and really interns as they kind of head out to the real world. I, I say, we don't hire to uh, replicate my skill set. We hire to complement my skill set. Right. I want people that come in and, and have a good back. Like we, our last hire, Greg Robbins. Why did we hire him? Well, first off, it was nice. He had a, he had a baseball background. He caught in high school and played some in college. And so that was a good fit. I love that he had a military background too. But in reality, he had run successful boot camps, and that was something that we were starting with more of our general fitness population. And uh, just as significantly, had a, had a big background in, in kettlebell training, things like that, which none of us on our staff had had. We'd all done it, but never with formal training and all like that. So right. he was an awesome fit on that front. And, and what we've been able to do since we brought him on staff is – We've had to bring them up to speed on some of our stuff, so we've sent them to a posture restoration institute course or two. Um, you know, we've we've given them opportunities to kind of you know basically evolve, you know, in, in some of Sarman's work and things like that. So um, you know, I think what you do is you you find people that bring unique skill sets that you don't already have because right. you can teach anybody anything. That, sure. That's not the hard part. No, I agree a hundred percent. With you know, you made the mention earlier on that you're not a technology guy, but you know, uh -huh. is there is there a is there an app or um, some websites maybe that you can recommend coaches check out or yeah. use? Yeah, I mean, uh, one that we do, uh, we use, uh, well, my website is ericcressy.com. There's free blogs and stuff like there all the time. Um, Elite Training Mentorship is a, is a, a membership site that we have. Um, it's myself, Mike Robertson, Vaughn Bethel, Tyler English, Dave Schmitz, um, and some other guys. Uh, so Elite Training Mentorship is uh, where we upload our, our in-services every month, some exercise demonstrations, some articles. Um, so there's a lot of online content every day, and you know, it's way the heck cheaper than you know flying to a seminar somewhere on the other side of the country country or yeah. you know, anything like that so uh, that's definitely a good option I, I wish I had had back in the day so I like that a lot um, you know and, and aside from that I'm, I'm kind of a I'm, a I'm an internet hopper I'll look all over the place I mean I'll still read Teenage and I'll read Elite Fitness yeah. uh, you know I'll, I'll read Robertson's blog uh, you know I, I still read a lot of the PRI stuff which I think is good when they update um, which Bill Hartman would write a little bit more often his stuff's always fun but he doesn't, right. he doesn't online quite as much um, so there are a lot of good options out there that I think are, are good things to check out but really the sky's the limit I think it depends on what you want to study um, sure. you, you want business stuff you know look at some of Pat Rigsby's stuff some Alan Cosgrove stuff, read Thomas Plummer's Facebook rants. They're pretty entertaining. So, you know, there are lots of different things you can check out on that front. Give us, a, give me a, a business book and, a, and, a, and then a strength and conditioning book that you recommend. Gotcha. Uh, business book, uh, Never Eat Alone. Um, was, a, was a great book. It was written by a guy, um, Keith Ferrazzi, I think is his last name. He was one of the marketing experts at uh, one of the big five accounting firms that were still kicking around. Um, he talks a lot about you know ways to win people over for life and cultivate relationships. So I, I like his stuff a lot. I'll give you an, an, I'll give you authors as well. Chip and Dan Heath. Okay. Um, those guys are more like social behavioral researchers. One's a professor at Duke and one's a professor at Stanford. They're brothers. I think they've had three New York Times bestsellers. Um, the most recent one was Decisive. They also wrote a book called Made to Stick, um, yeah. which all about like what what makes a good idea. And more importantly, how do you how do you get it integrated? You know, yeah. if you want to walk into a, a strength and conditioning environment and get your you know new thought processes accepted with athletes and coaches, you need to figure out how to deliver that message in the right avenue. So, sure. those are guys that I that I really like um, with respect to uh, you know, the business side of things, even if it's not you know 100 percent unique to strength and conditioning. Yeah, sure. With respect to training, uh, lots of good ones. Uh, I'll give you one of the more recent ones that I read. Probably read it last year. Uh, Clinical Applications of Neuromuscular Techniques. It's a, a two-part book. There's the lower body and the upper body. Um, it's about, um, I mean, it reads like stereo instructions. You'll cover about two pages a day. But uh, it's written by um, uh, Judith Delaney and Leon Scheitau. And um, I liked it a lot because it made us think a lot about, uh, you know, why certain soft tissue patterns develop. Sure. Uh, for me, it appealed a lot because it talked a lot about congenital laxity, which we see a lot in our baseball guys. Okay. Uh, so pretty interesting thing. And, and, and also one of those things that's just like, it gives you a bunch of good trivia questions and things like that. Stuff you <laughs> never expect to learn that probably won't necessarily make a difference in how you manage athletes, but they're kind of cool things to have in the back of your head. Very yeah. good read. No doubt. No, no. Is, uh, is there a quote? that you live by or is there one that's plastered in your weight room that you want your athletes to see every day? Yeah, we've got a couple couple on our weight room actually. One is uh, 
hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. I love I don't that know one. Who said it? Where it came from? But it's it's definitely on one of the walls of the facility. So the guys see that first thing when they walk in every day. Yeah, no, that's that's huge. That's huge. Yeah. Well, what's the uh, you know? I know you got you know functional stability training for the lower body right now. You um you know what what else do you got coming down the pipe here for 2014 or speaking in, uh, you know engagements that you may have that some guys can come check you out. Yeah, one of the one of the new things that we're doing. Uh, I should run the first one back in January is uh, something called Elite Baseball Mentorships. Um, it's myself, our pitching coordinator Matt Blake, and then a physical therapist we work with a lot, Eric Schoenberg. And um, we saw a really big need to, to start to educate the world on. Hey, he, he, there are a lot of unique demands to baseball players. Sure things that you don't see with other athletes and you can't just throw the one size fits all programs together. And obviously a lot of that stuff carries over to what you do with tennis players, quarterbacks, swimmers, things like that. Um, so we run, uh, baseball mentorships, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, actually just had our second one here in June and, and, uh, have a phase two in August, another phase one in December. It's, I mean, it's very cool because it's, there's obviously classroom education, um, but it's also heavily case study based. There's a lot of video analysis of throwers, um, kids from age 11 all the way up to, to big league to see what guys do as physiological and, and maturity kicks in and all that and, and what the impact of strength training is um, so they can see that and just importantly there's uh, a lot of hands-on stuff including on the floor observation of training so they see how our guys train they can watch bullpens um, interact with athletes so it's it's pretty cool it runs Sunday to Tuesdays at our facility um, a few times a year and um, it's, it's EliteBaseballMentorships.com. It's uh, been a pretty cool experience and, you know, well attended by, you know, guys from pro ball, guys from college, uh, guys from the private sector, everything from baseball coaches to, you know, strength coaches to athletic trainers to physical therapists. There's really something for everybody, and it's, 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 it's gotten very good reviews. I don't, I don't want to blow sunshine up our own butt, but on the evaluation forms from the first two mentorships, um, on a 0 to 10 scale, we haven't had anything below an 8 yet. That's so awesome. it's, it's gone well. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, man, I, I, you know, I know you're a busy guy, and we got on a little bit longer than I, uh, I thought we would. But I, I truly appreciate you giving the, uh, you know, some, giving us some time today, and and uh, it's awesome, bro. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me on. It's a big honor. Good, good to follow Joe too. That's a, uh, that's a pretty cool feather in my cap. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Thanks a lot, buddy. Thank you. Guys, do me a favor and please go to the comments section for this episode at ronmckeefer.com. And let us know what you think. Let us know what you think of the episode. Let us know uh, what we could do better. Um, and also let Eric know how much you appreciate his time and his efforts by coming on the show. While you're there at RobMcKeefer.com, go ahead and sign up for email updates as to future episodes and anything else that we have going on. And obtain your free ebook, uh, Weight Room Wisdom, for doing so just a free book with a, a several quotes that you can use with your athletes. I'd also like you to check out Strength on Demand. It's a project that we just finished up, Rob Taylor and myself, where it's an online archive of strength and conditioning clinic presentations from around the country with some of the top strength and conditioning coaches out there uh, delivering some great, great content. So check that out, strength-on-demand. And uh, we hope to come back next week with another great episode for you. Take care.